The final piece of the puzzle is here, everyone. SpaceX has just released a detailed update on exactly what happened during Starship Flight 9. With this, we now have a clear picture of all the issues the Starship Block 2 design is currently facing. Even more exciting, SpaceX has also shared how they're addressing each of these challenges. So, let's not wait any longer and dive right in. If you can remember back to May 27th, Starship lifted off from Starbase, Texas. The flight test kicked off with the first super heavy booster to be reflown, and it started up successfully, completing a full duration ascent burn with all 33 Raptor engines before separating from Starship's upper stage in a hot staging maneuver. During separation, Super Heavy performed what SpaceX called its first ever deterministic flip, followed by the boost back burn. Basically, this was a more controlled flip compared to earlier flights, made possible by partially blocking part of the hot staging ring to help guide the motion. After the boost back burn, Super Heavy re-entered with a much steeper angle of attack than in previous flights, peaking at around 17 degrees. This was part of a flight experiment to test the limits of the booster's performance and gather data. Once it reached the planned splashdown zone, the booster relit 12 of the planned 13 engines for the landing burn. But shortly after ignition, something went wrong. There was what SpaceX called an energetic event near the bottom of the vehicle, followed by a loss of telemetry. The final data came in around 382 seconds into flight, at about one kilometer in altitude over the designated clear zone. At the time, no one knew exactly what went wrong. Some thought maybe it had to do with the fact it was a reused booster or the steeper descent, but that was just speculation. Thankfully, SpaceX finally shed some light on it. According to them, the most probable cause of the failure during the landing burn was higher than expected forces on the booster structure, specifically on the fuel transfer tube, because of that steeper descent angle. Post-flight analysis showed the structural loads were more than the transfer tube could handle, which likely caused it to fail. That failure allowed methane and liquid oxygen to mix, which then ignited. So what's the fix? For the remaining flight test using this version of the Super Heavy Booster, SpaceX is going to reduce the angle of attack during descent. This should help cut down on the aerodynamic stress and lower the chances of anything breaking under pressure. And for the upcoming Starship Block 3, this issue is likely resolved entirely. In early July, SpaceX released images showcasing a redesigned transfer tube for the next generation of Super Heavy boosters. These new tubes, comparable in size to the entire first stage of a Falcon 9, are responsible for channeling cryogenic fuel from the main tank to all 33 Raptor engines. The redesigned structure is expected to be significantly stronger, enabling more reliable flip maneuvers and supporting simultaneous engine ignition during boost back and landing burns. Honestly, for version 2 of Starship, the booster isn't really the issue here. SpaceX has already shown they can catch it reliably. The real focus is on the Starship upper stage. SpaceX gave a pretty detailed explanation of what happened. After a successful stage separation, the Starship upper stage lit all six Raptor engines and followed its expected trajectory. About three minutes into the burn, sensors in the nose cone started detecting a steady increase in methane levels. This continued until around five minutes in, when pressure in the main fuel tank began to drop rapidly, while pressure in the nose cone increased at the same time. Despite this, Starship Systems managed to compensate for the drop in main tank pressure and complete the ascent burn, hitting the planned velocity and achieving second stage engine cutoff, SECO. According to SpaceX, the issue came from a fuel diffuser on the forward dome of the methane tank, located inside the nose cone of Ship 35. That diffuser is supposed to direct pressurized gas into the fuel tank from the autogenous pressurization system. But during Flight 9, it seems the diffuser failed during ascent, letting gaseous methane leak into the payload bay and nose cone. The pressurization system was still able to maintain high enough pressure in the methane tank during ascent, but that led to excessively high pressure building up in the nose cone. After engine shutdown, this high nose cone pressure, combined with planned nose cone venting, caused a large attitude error. The error kept growing until the vehicle's automatic fault system stepped in and disabled nose cone venting. That attitude error meant the ship skipped the payload deploy objective. Even if it had tried, the high pressure in the nose cone created abnormal loads on the mechanism responsible for opening the payload door, making deployment impossible. Eventually, the ship was able to reduce its attitude error using the reaction control thrusters, and nose cone venting was re-enabled as planned. About 40 seconds later, onboard cameras showed liquid methane entering the nose cone, and temperatures on multiple sensors and controllers began to drop. 
That triggered the automatic passivation system, which caused Starship to skip the in-space burn and vent all remaining propellant into space. Starship re-entered Earth's atmosphere in an off-nominal orientation, and comms were lost during entry. The final telemetry came in about 46 minutes into the flight, when the vehicle was roughly 59 kilometers in altitude and over the Indian Ocean within the planned re-entry zone. There were no violations of autonomous flight safety rules and the flight termination system was never triggered. While pre-flight analysis didn't predict this failure, SpaceX engineers were able to recreate it under flight-like conditions during testing at the McGregor, Texas facility. To fix the issue for future flights, the fuel diffuser has been redesigned to better direct pressurized gas into the main fuel tank and significantly reduce structural stress on the component. The new design went through a much more rigorous qualification campaign, facing flight-like stresses and operating for over 10 times its expected service life, with zero damage. So that's what happened with Starship Flight 9, but Block 2 still faces another major issue, the explosion of Ship 36. On Wednesday, June 18th, during preparations for the 10th Starship flight test, Ship 36 experienced a significant anomaly while on a test stand at Starbase. The vehicle was in the process of loading cryogenic propellant for a planned six-engine static fire when a sudden and energetic event led to the complete loss of the Starship and damage to the surrounding test area. Fortunately, there were no hazards to the surrounding communities in the Rio Grande Valley. However, this incident must be fully investigated before any further Block 2 flights can proceed. According to SpaceX, the most likely root cause was a damaged composite overwrapped pressure vessel, COPV, located in the payload bay section. The damage, either undetectable or inadequately screened, led to structural failure of the vehicle, followed by unintended propellant mixing and ignition. A composite overwrapped pressure vessel is a container consisting of a thin internal liner wrapped with a high strength fiber composite. It's designed to store fluids under high pressure. These COPVs, located in the payload section, store gaseous nitrogen for use in Starship's environmental control system. Typically, they are encased in a protective shell to shield them from impact damage. So why are COPV failures so difficult to detect? Composite overwrapped pressure vessels are deceptively complex structures. They typically consist of a metal or plastic liner made from materials like aluminum, steel, inconel, elastomers, or various polymers, surrounded by a composite overwrap. The liner acts as a barrier to prevent permeation of the stored gases, while the composite overwrap, made of high-strength fibers embedded in a cured resin, bears the structural load from the high internal pressures. Once a COPV is manufactured, it undergoes a process called auto-fretage, where the vessel is subjected to very high pressure to plastically deform the inner liner. This creates residual compressive stresses that help the COPV better withstand operational loads later on. But this is also where many questions arise. Did auto fretage alter the stress state in the liner in unintended ways? Did it cause microcrack initiation? And if so, will those cracks grow under repeated stress? Can current inspection techniques even detect those flaws? What is the COPV's actual tolerance to stress rupture or other failure modes over time? The failure mechanisms in COPVs are nuanced and not fully understood. While the cylindrical section is relatively straightforward in terms of geometry, the dome ends where the liner tapers and the fiber layers wrap over complex curves introduce significant complications. In these regions, fiber winding patterns involve changes in direction, stops, starts, and double curvature, all of which contribute to a highly variable and three-dimensional stress field. This complexity makes it extremely difficult to predict how the material will behave under load, especially over time or under thermal cycling. To truly understand COPV reliability, we need a deep grasp of the manufacturing process, material compatibility, and the operational environment. Unfortunately, many of these factors are hard to characterize or control precisely. But one thing is certain. When a COPV fails, it releases an immense amount of stored energy, and that can bring down an entire spacecraft in seconds. To address the issue, SpaceX is implementing several key changes to how COPVs are handled in upcoming flights. First, COPVs will now operate at reduced pressures, lowering the overall stress on the vessels. Additional inspections and proof testing will be conducted before any reactive propellants are loaded onto a vehicle, further reducing the risk of failure. SpaceX has also updated its COPV acceptance criteria to tighten quality control standards and ensure only the most robust vessels are approved for flight. 
In addition, a new non-destructive evaluation method has been developed to detect internal damage that would otherwise go unnoticed with previous inspection techniques. To enhance protection during operations, new external covers are now being added to COPVs during integration. These covers provide both physical shielding and visual cues that could indicate potential damage, offering an added layer of safety and early warning capability. Looking ahead, once Starship is certified and enters regular operation, it would be wise for SpaceX to manufacture its own Starship COPV, something the company already does for Falcon 9. By bringing COPV production in-house, SpaceX could gain greater control over both quality assurance and inspection processes, reducing reliance on external suppliers and improving reliability across the board. With these challenges identified and solutions already in motion, the road ahead for Starship looks more promising than ever. The issues uncovered in recent tests, while serious, are exactly the kind of hurdles that iterative development is designed to overcome. SpaceX has never aimed for perfection on every flight. Instead, it's all about learning fast, fixing fast, and flying again even better. Now, with Block 3 vehicles rolling out and major upgrades across the board, stronger structures, refined fuel systems, and more robust safety mechanisms, Starship is approaching the threshold where routine, reliable flights become the norm. The goal isn't just to fly to orbit. It's to do it regularly, affordably, and at scale. That future is coming into focus. We're not far from seeing Starships launching larger payloads, deploying full satellite constellations, and supporting lunar missions through NASA's Artemis program. And beyond that, there's the long-term vision, creating a fully reusable interplanetary transport system capable of taking humans to Mars and building the foundation for a multi-planetary civilization. To reach that point, the next few flights will be crucial. We'll likely see full mission profiles tested, payload deployment, on-orbit refueling, controlled re-entry, and eventually, the first attempts to catch both stages post-flight. Every success will build momentum, and every failure will sharpen the design further. What we're witnessing isn't just the evolution of a rocket. It's the shaping of a transportation system that could redefine access to space for decades to come.